purpose of the Flick Reedy Education Enterprises is to promote individual moral responsibility through education. How do we do this? We study and discuss the interrelationships of history, philosophy, social studies, and economics. We do not dictate. We do not make statements as to what we think you should or should not do. We do not unduly burden this program with footnotes, references, or complete documentation. However, we do give sufficient data to bring this discussion into proper focus. We invite you to delve further into the necessary historical and statistical data to develop a deeper understanding of truth and a keener sense of individual moral responsibility. It might be well to begin our study of modern socialism with a quotation by a pioneer leader in the union labor movement of America, Samuel Gompers, on the subject of socialism. He had this to say. I want to tell you socialists that I have studied your philosophy, read your works upon economics, studied your standard works, both in English and German. I have heard your orators and watched the work of your movement the world over. I have kept watch upon your doctrine for 30 years, have been closely associated with many of you, and know how you think and what you propose. I know, too, what you have up your sleeve. And I want to say that I am entirely at variance with your philosophy. Economically, you are unsound. Socially, you are wrong. And industrially, you are an impossibility. Contrast this with a statement of Norman Thomas, six-time candidate for U.S. president on the Socialist Party ticket, who said, The American people will never knowingly adopt socialism, but under the name of liberalism, they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until America will one day be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. Which of these two men had a correct vision for our United States? Only time will tell. But Norman Thomas's statement provides incentive for knowing more about the nature of socialism. There is much talk about socialism in our country these days. We read about it in our newspapers and magazines, see and hear about it on radio and TV. Why do some people fear it while others seek it? Once again, let's look back into history and then bring ourselves up to the present. The idea of socialism started quite a way back and leads right up to the present Cold War and sometimes to a limited hot war or police action. Both such wars, cold and hot, are a fight between what we have called earlier the two worlds. The one, ours, says that man should be free and that government's main job is to help him stay that way. The other, the world of regimentation, says that the government should own or control almost everything and tell the people what to do. The earth is split over these basic ideas. The United States leads the part of the world that believes in free people. The Russian government, which may or may not have the support of a majority of its people, leads the other part of the world, the part that believes in government ownership of the tools of production and government control over a substantial part of the lives of the people. It has been argued that somehow communist China or communist Yugoslavia is different from communist Russia. This difference could be compared to the difference between the flames that come from wood fires, paper fires, coal fires, and so forth. All the fires have one thing in common. If not controlled or put out, they burn other things. They destroy other things. This conflict of the ideas is the biggest moral, economic, and political issue of our lives. It started with a plan to socialize the world. That plan was contained in the book, The Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, published in 1848 in London, England. Yes, it was this source that gave rise to modern socialism as well as communism. Although Marx and many communist leaders who followed him made no clear distinction between socialism and communism, socialists, or at least some of them, do make a distinction between the terms, as we shall see later. Marx had the idea that the only way in which the working people could better their lot was to revolt against the owners and collect land and industry for ownership and control by the government, which was to be a dictatorship of the workers. He felt that such a revolution would succeed at a time of crisis. Therefore, leaders of the workers should study methods of revolution in preparation for a time of crisis, economic and political. Some 20 years later, Marx presented his ideas on economics in his book, Das Kapital, which attempted to explain and clarify his earlier vague economic ideas presented in the Communist Manifesto. Just as Marx had borrowed from Hegel's philosophy of dialectics, so also was he to borrow his economic ideas from another. Marx got many of his ideas from an Englishman named Robert Owen, who had begun his work in England and continued it in New Harmony, Indiana. It was Owen's work which gave rise to the use of the word socialism in its modern sense. Robert Owen was a cotton mill owner. He saw socialism as the effort of the owner masters to improve the lot of the working people. He was an idealist, sincere, and dedicated. About the same time Robert Owen was experimenting with his socialism, the trade unions were trying to improve the workers' lot also. The difference was that Owen wanted to change the economic system of his time, while the trade unions did not then try to change the economic system. 
Marx, a masterful borrower of ideas, put both of these ideas together. He felt the way to help the workers was to get the trade union movement, the workers, to replace the capitalistic system with a socialist economic system. By this, Marx changed socialism from a master's benevolent movement into a workers' revolutionary movement. Whether we like or agree with the ideas and writings of Marx, no one can deny that they've had a massive impact upon the world, perhaps both greater and more rapid than even religions have had in the last 100 years or so. When Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, the words socialism and communism meant the same thing. It was really not until the 20th century that a change occurred. The Russian socialists communists split into two groups. One advocated government reform by more or less peaceful means. The other wanted violent revolution. In Russian, the word Bolsha means the larger. Because the group that wanted violent revolution wanted to be considered the majority, they adopted the label Bolsheviks. And as we learned in our study of communism, overthrew the socialist government of Kerensky in 1917. What was happening elsewhere? In Italy, Marx's ideas were adopted by Benito Mussolini. He had been editor of a socialist newspaper for years. He later turned upon the Socialist Party and created a revolutionary party, which he named the Fascist Party. This word, fascist, was taken from an old Latin Roman word, fasces, meaning bundle of sticks, which was the ancient Roman symbol of authority. Mussolini's Fascist Party came to power in Italy in 1922. In actuality, then, the fascists were a blend of socialism and communism, emphasizing state ownership and or state control, primarily by one man. The downfall of Mussolini's socialist communist experiment in Italy is well known. The GIs who liberated Italy from both Hitler's and Mussolini's domination know firsthand the misery of the Italian people of Mussolini's time. In Germany, the ideas of Marx festered and were finally picked up by an obscure house painter and World War I corporal named Hitler. To Marx's basic ideas, Hitler provided a scapegoat with some nonsense about racial superiority of the Germans. Closely paralleling Marx's terminology, Hitler selected for his political party the name the Nationalist Socialist Party, or as we know it, the Nazi Party. Hitler came into power in 1933 with his particular brand of socialism. While he did not make a fetish of owning all property and industry, there was no question about who controlled everything. The heritage of the United States is the product of many countries. Let's see how socialism gained power in England because the heritage of the United States is closest to that of England. What was planned to socialize England? It began in 1883 with the Fabian Society. Where did they get such a name and why? It was taken from an ancient Roman general, Fabius, who never fought a big battle, but always wore his enemies down by cutting off small bits of the enemy's army. He wore Hannibal down that way over a 10-year period until Hannibal became easy prey for a younger Roman general, Scipio. There you have the secret of England's Fabian society. The leading English socialists were not of a revolutionary mind. Socialism by peaceful means was their goal, and they felt they could do it, a little bit at a time, until they reached their goal. If they could manage it, they would never present to the people the whole package of socialism for a vote, but let them vote for socialism one piece at a time. Do the words of Norman Thomas quoted earlier have a similar ring? Probably at no time in the entire history of the Fabian Society has it had more than four to 5,000 members at once. The Fabian Society of England has included such noted English persons as George Bernard Shaw, author, critic, poet, playwright, Ramsay MacDonald, the politician, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, and Annie Besant. How could we describe the plan of the Fabian Society in simple terms? It would be something like this. One, take one small step at a time. Two, avoid the use of the verb socialism. Three, recommend welfare measures. Four, obtain control of the labor unions. Five, cooperate with the Liberal Party until the Labor Party can effectively absorb it. Six, attract and engulf the influential sources of public opinion, clergymen, teachers, authors, professional people. Seven, advocate state ownership of key industries, always under the guise of humanitarianism. Did their plan work? You bet it did. It worked so well that very few people knew what was happening until it was all over, and many didn't even realize it then. Almost no one was upset. How did it specifically achieve its goal? One, it achieved control of the labor unions which paid its bills and supplied the necessary votes. Two, it engulfed the Liberal Party and absorbed it into the Labor Party, which attained national power in 1945. Three, it didn't mention socialism, but preached of welfare, and as a result, seduced a significant percentage of the church and the press and the teaching profession. What state ownership did it achieve? The Bank of England, motor, rail, and air transport electric power, coal, steel industry, and national medical care, among others. So the Fabian Society achieved socialism for England under the banner of social progress, or welfare, or planning, or security. 
The people, or at least enough of them, were convinced that they just couldn't take care of their own problems. The state had to do it for them. Whatever anyone calls it, the final result is the same. The government has the power and control. And who is to pay the bills? Why, of course, the people. The Chancellor of Exchequer, in our language, it would be the Secretary of Treasury, Sir Stafford Cripps, one of the leading socialists, said this to the English Parliament one day. When I hear people speaking of reducing taxation, and at the same time see the costs of social services rising rapidly in response, very often to the demands of the same people, I sometimes wonder whether they appreciate the old adage, we cannot have our cake and eat it. On another occasion, Sir Stafford said that he believed that within 10 years, the United States would be socialized to a greater extent than England. Well, for a man who knew how it was accomplished in England, he may be better informed than most of us. So let's turn our attention to the United States. The Socialist Party in the United States was formally organized in 1901 by Eugene Debs. The early plans of the American socialists were blindly patterned after Marx's revolutionary principles. The workers, through their government, were to take over all industry and run them for the workers' benefit. It just didn't sell at all. Americans didn't cotton to the idea of revolution. The socialists failed to realize that Mr. Average American was not very similar to the Russian peasant or the perpetually poor class of European history. It took the socialists a while, but they finally got the point. So they changed their tactics. It's not known to what extent the American socialists were influenced by the English Fabians to change their tactics. Perhaps they were also warned away from the tactics Lenin was using in Russia about that time. In any event, they did change their tactics and methods because it was obvious Mr. Average American simply was not interested in a revolution. The socialists entered the national political picture by running Eugene Debs for U.S. president on the socialist ticket in 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920. He failed, but interestingly enough, he received nearly one million votes in 1920, despite the fact that he ran his campaign from prison where he was serving a 10-year espionage sentence. The Socialist Debs platform of 1920 included, one, all vital business and industry should be taken over by the nation, the government. Two, all publicly owned industry should be operated at no profit. Three, take over all banks. Four, take over all insurance businesses. Socialist Norman Thomas ran for U.S. president six times beginning in 1928 with no success. It became more and more apparent that Mr. Average American would not buy socialism under that name. Socialist failure at the polls made them reflect upon their tactics. The concept of encroaching control was brought forward by Stephen Rauschenbusch in several articles which appeared in the socialist periodical The New Leader in its issues of March 5th and 12th of 1927. Rauschenbusch was the secretary of the Socialist Committee on Coal and Giant Power, created by the League for Industrial Democracy an offshoot of the original Intercollegiate Socialist Society, which was formed in 1905 to influence college groups to adopt socialism. Rauschenbusch explained why the United States would not achieve socialism by the revolution method, saying, We have no caste system in this country. We do not have quite the inferiority complex of the European workers upon which to found our philosophy. The workers of this country are climbing through marriage, the education of their children and the like, out of the proletariat as rapidly as they can go about the business. The chances are against the amalgamation in the near future of these various class struggles into one against the whole profit system. Now he gets to the meat of his reasons. There is no driving power for social change like hunger. The old time carrying drive of socialist doctrine was in poverty and prophetic promise. These no longer hold us. Between cataclysmic socialism, revolution, and encroaching control, a little socialism at a time, the latter will be the only one acceptable to this nation for a long while. The socialists regarded the 1920s and 30s as a period in which the American people were to be softened up for a little socialism at a time. In 1929, Rauschenbusch said, While the long-time aim of the liberal and radical groups is the abolition of the profit system for private use, our present strategy should be to make and take every opportunity to prove that there is something better than the profit system. Within the next 10 years, we are going to have a chance such as we have not had in the last 40. 